white text over video of past events. Logo, Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Professional Development Series presents Access 101, Part 1, An Introduction to Disability and Accessibility. At left, presentation slides. At top right, mini video of presenting speaker. Below, an ASL interpreter signs. Hi, my name is Anna. I am a coach, one of three co-chairs with the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium, or CCAC. Before we get started today, I just wanted to introduce myself and also give a note on the accessible services at today's program. Like I said, my name is Anna. A visual description of myself is I am a 30-something white woman with curly, short brown hair. I also use she, her pronouns. Um, I also just wanted to note, I am giving this presentation from my home, so please bear with me if there are any internet connectivity issues. We have some backups, but nothing is perfect, so thanks for humoring us. Um, I've been with CCAC since 2015 and have helped lead the organization as a co-chair since 2017. And now I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenter today, Susan Friel, to introduce herself. Greetings, everyone. My name is Susan Friel. And a uh, visual description of me is I am a mature woman with colorful hair, blue in the front, purple in the back, I think you tell that, and sparkly earrings. Um, I have been on this, uh, it's my second year actually, on the steering committee for CCAC, and I've been involved in going to lots of great programming, so I hope that we'll see you again there too. Welcome. Thank you so much, Susan. So a note on the accessible services that we have going today. Captions are available by clicking on the CC button and selecting view subtitles. We also have American Sign Language interpretation available throughout the program. To pin the interpreter to be able to see them at all times, just hover over the corner of the interpreter's video frame until three dots appear. Click on those and you'll get a drop down menu and then you want to select pin. We do have two interpreters, so if you want to see both of them, you may need to um, message one of our support people in the chat to enable multi pin. If you have any trouble accessing the captions or ASL, reach out to our Zoom logistics people. Their names are Karen and Casey, and they both have CCAC listed with their names in the chat. So they'll be your troubleshooting uh, team today. Thank you so much. Uh, please remember to keep yourself on mute throughout the program today. There will be time for some questions at the end of the presentation, but we're asking that you submit all of your questions via the chat box. So we're going to collect those throughout. So feel free to type a question in at any time, and then we're just going to lump them all together and answer them at the end. Today's program is part one of a two-part series, which we're calling Access 101. Today's presentation will be an introduction to disability and accessibility, specifically within cultural institutions, such as museums or theaters. Next week, same time, same place, we are doing a panel discussion, which is titled Access 101 Individual Perspectives. And that's going to feature four panelists who each have a different history and experience with disability. So you'll be able to hear directly from the people that all of these programs benefit. If you haven't already registered for that program, I would highly, highly encourage you to do so. I think it's really a necessary counterpart to today's presentation. Lastly, I just wanted to mention CCAC is an entirely volunteer run nonprofit. If you're able to support our work now or in the future, please visit our website at chicagoculturalaccess.org and make a small donation. Every little bit helps and we really, really do appreciate it. And with that, I think that is all of my housekeeping for the day for today, so we can get into the fun stuff, which is our program. Next slide, website chicagoculturalaccess.org. All right, so today is Access 101, Introduction to Disability and Accessibility. Just a little note about CCAC. It's like I said, it stands for the Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. Our mission is to empower Chicago's cultural spaces to become more accessible to visitors with disabilities. We do that few, through a few different modes. We have professional development workshops, which is what this is. We try to do them once a month, basically school year calendar, September through May. 
We also have an accessible equipment loan program, which I am very excited to announce is going to be relaunching in the next week. So if you have used that in the past, if you want to use it again in the future, we had to take a hiatus during the pandemic, but now that things are opening up again, we have worked through some new systems. It is now also going to be housed in partnership with the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum. So you'll be seeing a lot more come out on that um, on the listserv in the coming days for instructions on how to use that, but that is going to be a wonderful resource, especially if you're just getting started with accessibility. We also have an access calendar. So if you have these really fantastic accessible programs that you're bringing in ASL interpreters or audio describers for, you can submit them to the CCAC calendar and then we help publicize them to the community. So it's a one-stop shop for people with disabilities who are interested in these programs where they can go and filter based on what accommodations they personally need. Also, we also provide um, just a network for people who are doing this work within their organizations. A lot of times access work can be a little lonely. There's typically just one or two people at an organization who are super committed and passionate about making spaces more accessible. So we want to provide that safe space where you can meet other people who are doing similar work and really uh, just share your struggles, share your uh, successes and get some help if you need it. Next slide website, chicagoculturalaccess.org forward slash ICAN. We also, CCAC also hosts the Illinois Cultural Accessibility Network, which is very similar to CCAC, but on a statewide level. It's been a little quiet during the pandemic since we haven't been able to travel, but if you are outside of the immediate Chicago area, we are working on ramping that program up so that you'll have more resources available to you as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Susan to talk a little bit about disability paradigms. Next slide, two photographs. Medical model shows patients in a hospital setting. Social model shows a person in a wheelchair at the base of steps outside a building entrance. Can you switch the slide for us? So basically we're looking, we're gonna start off by looking at two major model, models. One is the medical model, one is the social model. And the medical model essentially is that people with disabilities are something, uh, are something to be fixed. So the focus is on the individual and um, looking at how that can be changed, how they can be changed. The social model, on the other hand, is looking at the environment in which people exist and, and our society as a whole, and looks at how we can change and make the environment more friendly, removing barriers, bar barriers, excuse me, and obstacles. So let's look at where those two things came from. Can we have the next slide? So starting in uh, around 1990, the Americans Disabilities Act, you might be familiar with ADA, this definition for disability that they have um, been promoting is someone, notice it's a person, who has, has a record of or is regarded as having a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or ma more major life activities, such as eating, breathing, walking, talking, and seeing. So this is person focused. This is the medical model. The second model that we're gonna take a quick look at is the one, um, promoted by the World Health Organization, which looks at disability as part of being human. Almost everyone will temporarily or permanently experience disability at some point in their life. And disability results from the interaction between the individual with the health condition, as well as personal and environmental factors, including negative attitudes, inaccessible transportation, and public buildings and limited social support. So next up, how many people are we talking about? What is the scope of disability it's in America specifically? We're all in America, maybe. I don't know, there might be people here internationally. Um, one in five Americans has a disability that's as recorded by the US Census that impacts one in three American families, which is just a huge, huge percentage of all of our audiences when you think about it. It also impacts 37% of seniors in the state of Illinois. So I know a lot of our organizations are serving older audiences. So if you're serving seniors, you have to also be thinking about accessibility and disability and how that impacts your programs. Um, you can see a list here, some things that typically are very common that come on later in um, somebody's life. Um, you also have the issue, especially with seniors, that people may not self-identify 
as having a disability because it's something they have slowly aged into over time. So then we want to start thinking about, well, how do we make things more accessible, not just for one individual, but for our entire audience? How do we make things a little more universal? People with disabilities are the largest minority group in the United States. It's also the only minority group that anybody can enter at any point in their life. If you have an accident tomorrow, you may all of a sudden become somebody with a disability and then have need of these accessible services. Um, it's a very fluid identity in some ways. Um, we also wanna talk about temporary disabilities. So being accessible doesn't just mean that you're here to help people who've had a disability from birth. You're also helping out people who maybe broke their leg last week and need an accessible seat at your theater, um, things like that. So just keep all of that in mind. Um, I, I feel like the identity of disability, quote unquote, people sometimes think of it very narrowly, but it is a much broader category when you really think about all the people who would benefit from these services that we're gonna talk about. I also find these statistics are very useful if you have to make the case to the higher ups in your organization who may not care all that much that this is a huge portion of your audience that you can't ignore. So that's the other reason I put all these out. I may have used these myself in other conversations. So next up, why does accessibility matter aside from all of those statistics that we just talked about? Um, cultural and arts organizations, which if you are here, it's because you probably work for or are interested in working for, or have some sort of affinity with a museum, theater, park, library, those kinds of spaces. All of those uh, are committed to creating a positive experience for all of their visitors. If your organization serves the public, um, you wanna serve all of the public. You don't get to pick and choose who your visitors are. This is critical to equity work and being an inclusive organization is to be accessible. Because like we just saw, a third of, of your families include somebody with a disability. So you don't want to exclude um, a huge portion of your audience. Also, everybody has the right to participate fully in the cultural life of their community. So that's a right that they have that we don't have the right to take away from them. Also, if those reasons aren't good enough, it's also just good business. People with disabilities represent $200 billion in discretionary spending in the United States. So you're cutting off a lot of your revenue source if you aren't gonna be accessible to people with disabilities. And also, if all of that didn't convince you or the powers that be, it is also the law. You really don't have a choice. Um, we are all places of public accommodation as defined by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So you are required to be accessible. Accessibility can take a lot of different forms and we're gonna get into some specifics later in the presentation, um, but it is, it is a legal requirement. So those, are, those should be all of your motivating factors. And now I think Susan's gonna chip in with some notes on language, which is always a, a sensitive topic. There you go. So we're going to talk about purple, purple, there you go, people first language. <laughs> and I think the picture at the bottom of the screen gives you a little clue to what we're talking about. So there's people of all ages, abilities, um, backgrounds, and it's just about that. It's about people, as Anna was saying. Um, put the people before their disabilities. We're all people first. Avoid euphemisms and outdated language. Those are um, sometimes can be great quite cringeworthy, which we'll see in the next slide. And beware of nuance. The good rule of thumb is to talk about the person first. So if for institutional language, or if you are um, printing something, that's kind of a baseline. But if somebody identifies, um, particularly if they say that they wanna be referred to as um, the deaf community, for, cap for example, the capital D, or the autistic community, then take your lead from the person who identifies themselves, right? But the default mode is definitely people first. Um, as I said earlier, referred to, these are some things to give you an idea of what to say, what not to say. Link in description below to PDF of chart. Right, so definitely focus on those on the left-hand side. There's a whole list of here of um, some vocabulary you may have heard, some that you may have heard other people use or you at a previous time may have used. So the ones on the right are ones that you want to eliminate from your vocabulary. And the ones on the left 
refer to person with a disability, person with a spinal cord injury, for example, person of short stature, someone who uses a wheelchair, things of, of that nature, rather than focusing on the deficit, focus on the person. And um, I think that's probably gonna get you further than you um, focusing on the person is what we've been talking about. Back to you, Anna. Uh, yeah, and like Susan mentioned with that, there is a lot of nuance in language. Language is always tough. I think everybody has different preferences. And I think people first is a good default for institutional communication, for something you're gonna put on a website or print in a brochure. But for your frontline staff that are working one-on-one -on -one with people, that's where you really do wanna to defer to how people identify themselves, especially there are certain communities like the deaf community, the autistic community who are more disability first because that is an intrinsic part of their identity. Um, there is a lot written on disability language. So feel free to do your own research and read what people are talking about with all of that. Um, so now we're gonna move on to the second big chunk of our presentation today. So the first half was a lot of background. Now we're moving into more specifics and we're gonna review four of the major categories of disability and some of the common accommodations that you are gonna to want to explore for your institution, depending on what works for you starting off with mobility related disabilities. This is probably what a lot of people think of when they think of disability, they think of people who are using wheelchairs, um, but it includes people who use canes, maybe a powered device, or maybe don't use anything at all and just have trouble standing for long periods of time and need uh, benches or seating so they can have frequent breaks, things like that. So you, again, you wanna broaden your perspective a bit on what mobility disability might mean. This is the largest disability category in the United States. It impacts 25 million Americans. And similar to what I was saying before, it includes people who are both ambulatory and non-ambulatory. So maybe somebody uses a wheelchair 24 hours a day and or during their waking hours um, and need assistance with basic daily tasks, but maybe they just use it when they know they're gonna be walk, they have to be mobile for a long period of time, but they are capable of walking or standing on their own. So again, don't judge. Don't make assumptions about what somebody is capable of doing just because you see that they're using a wheelchair or a cane or what have you. Some basic wheelchair etiquette, especially for folks who might be on your frontline staff or helping patrons as they're arriving at your, at your venue. Never lean or hang on a person's wheelchair. Never push somebody's wheelchair unless they ask you to, unless they ask for assistance. Um, basically think of a wheelchair as an extension of their personal space. Like you wouldn't come up to somebody and just start shaking their arm and because you want to get their attention. So just don't, don't touch somebody's wheelchair. It's part of their, their person. Um, do when you're working with a patron who's using a wheelchair, sit down or get lower so that you're looking eye to eye. So they aren't craning their neck up to, to make eye contact with you. Just basic customer service stuff. Now, some common accommodations that you're gonna, that should be at the top of your list if you're just getting started with accessibility at your venue. You should provide an accessible entrance. So your front doors or your side doors, wherever all the other guests are entering through, is it accessible to somebody who's using a wheelchair or other mobility device? Um, an accessible route. So once they're in, can they get to where they need to go within the building or within the area? And also, of course, you have to have accessible restrooms, very important, and, and, an, and an accessible route to get to the accessible restrooms. You would be shocked how often that may not be the case. Um, it's always nice if you can provide wheelchairs for visitors um, so that they don't have to bring their own if it's not something that they use on a regular basis, but maybe just want to use while they're out and about. Family or gender neutral restrooms, if you don't already have these, these are a really big benefit, not only for people who might be gender nonconforming, but also for people who might need assistance toileting. Um, having the larger private space can be really beneficial to that. Something else along with that that you might wanna consider, adult changing tables, if you have the space. Um, they, do, they can be a little large, but a really wonderful thing to have if, if you can. Also, and this is more for our friends in theaters, seating, well, or I guess museums as well, seating both with and without armrests. Some people need the armrest to give them more 
um, resistance as they're moving around. Some people prefer to have more space so that they can that they can work with. So it really depends on personal preference. Um, and then ticketing. This is a big one. And honestly, accessible ticketing could be its own 90 minute presentation easily. Um, I would highly recommend you check out this fact sheet that is in the presentation here, adata.org slash fact sheet slash ticketing. Um, that is the ADA national network and their fact sheet has a lot of really good info, but there are a lot of rules and regulations about how theaters and performing arts spaces manage their accessible seats and how you are required to price them, how they need to be made available, how you need to manage companion seats that go along with those accessible seats. So just make sure that you are you have researched all of that um, thoroughly, but it's something to be aware of if, if you hadn't been aware of it before. And I think I'm turning it back over to Susan for hearing related disabilities. 20 million Americans, that's a lot of people who have some degree of hearing loss. And that there's a wide range from people who um, have no ability at all to hear or very, very little to people who just can benefit by some of the, the supports that we offer folks. Um, many of these people also are aging and they're, they're not used to the idea of being considered part of this group or they don't know, they don't necessarily um, know some of the services that are available. So we'll look at that in just a moment. And of course, you can't tell by looking at somebody if they can hear you or not. So they will have to self-identify. So we like to make it as, um, as open as possible so that anyone can use the services and not have to um, be relegated to a specific place or sort of sidelined. And you might look for some of these symbols that we have at the bottom of the screen, the assisted listening device, which is like an ear shape with a line going through it, these um, universal sign for American Sign Language, two hands, and then open and closed captioning, which we'll get into in just a little bit. A square with the letters OC and CC. You got actually a little peek, a little peek at that already. So on the next slide, um, let's just start with what are just very um, common sense accommodations, right? So part of good customer service is always listening attentively, right? So be aware of what the person is to whom you are speaking whether they seem to be catching on or not, or they might need something else. And don't pretend that you understand something if you're not able to understand them or look for the signs that they're not understanding you. Speak to the visitor, not the interpreter, right? The interpreter is a tool that is there to help them, but you are there for the visitor. You use all the things that you can possibly think of to make communication more um, comfortable for both. You can even write a note. You can write, use paper and pencil or on your screen if you have uh, um, your phone with you. Also look directly at the visitor and try to keep your hands free from your face and just talk normally, no need to shout. You'll figure out between the two of you or many other people <laughs> how to make this communication work. So on the next slide, here are some more accommodations that are more specific to um, a presentation or an event and more institutional kind of common knowledge or common um, accommodations. The first one is email contact, right? What good is a phone number um, for someone who may not be familiar with using the phone or not used to using the phone? Uh, assisted listening devices, make sure you have those available. There are also many um, devices that you can use related to personal phone use. Real-time captioning, um, American Sign Language, we talked about just a little bit, and open caption videos. There's a picture at the bottom of the screen that gives you a really good view of what that looks like. So you can see that the captions are live, they're happening with in close proximity to the people who are on the stage. So it's not a separate other place, people have to like tune into two separate places. It's happening right there on the stage and everyone can see it. It's similar to when, um, you know, many times when you go to the opera, for example, it's in a language that's different than um, the native language of the speaking audience. So it's similar to that, but it just becomes part of the scene. Back to you, Anna. Thanks. I will also add that if you are unfamiliar with assistive listening devices or CART, um, that is something that we 
Uh, some of that equipment is available through the CCAC Equipment Loan Program. So that is a great opportunity if you would like to try out some of these things, but don't want to make the investment of buying them quite yet for your institution or need to build um, a case and justify why they're necessary. Stay tuned for more news about Equipment Loan coming in the next week. Next slide shows audio description logo, the capital letters A, D, followed by three closed parentheses. But yes, on to visual, uh, excuse me vision-related disabilities, which impacts about 11 million Americans, some good accommodations for people who are blind or have low vision. And actually, I want to take a step back and mention that um, when we talk about vision-related disabilities, we're not talking about just people who are 100% blind. Um, vision-related disabilities also applies to people who have low vision, but do have some residual vision. And a lot of times can read things or use uh, visual items that you may have, but may need special accommodations to do so. So that's where a lot of this um, accommodation language is targeted. Audio description is a really cool tool for people who have a vision related disability, especially for live performances. If you're not familiar with audio description, that is where say you're at a theater, um, the person who is blind or has low vision will be sitting in the audience and they'll have a headset on and that, that headset is going to be connected wirelessly to an audio describer who is sitting in the back typically and will have a special mask on with a microphone. And as the play is going on on stage, they are working and talking in between the lines of dialogue and describing the physical movement that is happening on the stage and making sure that they are pointing out important elements that might be crucial to the plot, like so-and-so just entered the room in a, in a tizzy or in a huff or whatever. So it gets across important information. It's really, there's really an art to audio describing because you have to be able to get a lot of information across without taking away from the dialogue and not stepping on the actors. Um, but we also have audio description equipment available to rent through the equipment loan program. Um, something definitely to look into. There are a lot of really accomplished audio describers in Chicago that can help you out if you're looking to get started with it. Something else to look at, um, use large fonts, use high contrast colors. I do not identify as somebody with a vision disability. I just have poor general eyesight and have my whole life. Even I have trouble with teeny tiny little caption or labels at art museums and things like that. So the bigger the better when it comes to fonts. Provide electronic versions of printed items. Like I said, a lot of folks who have vision related disabilities do have residual vision. And a lot of times if they have an electronic version of something, they can put it on their own device, blow it up, change the contrast and make it readable for them. So that's something that's great to have, especially like your programs, your maps for museums um, so that your frontline staff can just email those out to people if they ask in advance of their visit. Also, and this is just part of being but more for museums, but just part of being good museum educators, provide information in more than one way. Don't have everything just on a label. Provide tactile, multi-sensory opportunities so that people can get that information in multiple ways. Uh, in your galleries, in your uh, exhibitions, avoid objects that are going to hang over the walking path that aren't cane detectable on the ground, so you stop people from walking into something. And also web accessibility. This is a huge, huge thing since so much is online right now, anytime. Um, you wanna make sure that your website and any information that you're putting out is readable by a screen reader, which is a special tool that people who have vision related disabilities might have downloaded onto their computer or their phone. And it's actually gonna read all of the text on a website or whatever document they're looking at allowed to them to get that information. So you wanna make sure that whatever your website has out there is compatible with that. And also you wanna make sure that all of your images have alt tags because when that screen reader runs into an image, it's gonna read aloud whatever, whatever is in the alt tag. And if that alt tag is nonsense or doesn't really describe what the image is or why it's important, then that's useless. And it can also just be very annoying for people who are using screen readers to come across that kind of stuff. Some communication tips for people who are blind or have low vision. Similar to a lot of the other tips, just general good customer service, greet guests, identify yourself. If you've helped somebody to a certain area and you need to leave, let them know that you're leaving. Don't just leave them there stranded. Um, 
ask if they need assistance. Don't just assume. Again, these folks have been living with their disability for years in most cases, and they know how they navigate the world better than you do. Um, don't touch or grab them to get their attention. Just maybe say hello, let them know that you're there to help if needed. Speak in a normal tone of voice and don't shout. It seems silly, but it does need to be said. Don't pet service dogs. And we're actually gonna talk about service animals next because I know that is always a hot topic, at least in the museum conferences that I go to, that is always a hot topic. Um, and use, an important one is to use descriptive language and specific directions. So for instance, if your um, frontline staff are giving instructions to somebody how to get to a gallery, you wanna say, oh, you go maybe 50 feet down the hallway, turn to your right, there's a small staircase, it's three steps down, and then you're at the entrance of the exhibition. Be specific with your language so that the visitor knows what they're expecting and can be prepared for whatever obstacles they may encounter. Next slide, service animals. Like I promised, a note on service animals. Um, I come from the museum world, so this is always a hot topic for us. Um, the legal requirements for a service animal, it is a dog. It is only a dog. Only dogs are service animals. Sometimes there is an exception for a miniature horse, but that is a highly specialized thing and it is not something I have ever seen in real life with my own eyes. Um, the dog has been trained to perform a specific action to help the person with the disability. Service dogs do not need to be wearing a vest. They do not need to have any paperwork with them. You cannot ask to see any paperwork from a service dog. Um, there are two questions that you're allowed to ask if you think somebody's service animal isn't legit and you wanna deny them entry. You can ask, is the animal required because of a disability? And you can ask, what task has the animal been trained to perform? That's it. So don't ask to see papers, don't ask if they can put on a vest, any of that stuff. Um, there is a difference between service animals and emotional support animals. You are required to accommodate service animals, but not emotional support animals. So the difference there is that emotional support animals have not necessarily been trained to perform a specific task. Um, for instance, a service dog maybe can sense I have low blood pressure, I tend to pass out, so it can sense when I am about to have a fainting spell and can come over to me, warn me so that I can get to a safe place to sit down and rest. Um, that dog is performing a specific action to help me, the person with a disability, in this hypothetical. An emotional support animal, on the other hand, maybe somebody has anxiety and they have a cat that they hold and holding the cat comforts them because cats are great and being like with another living thing is lovely. That cat is not actually performing a task. It hasn't been trained to do anything. It's just being a cat. Um, so that is the, the difference there between service animal and emotional support animal. You are not legally required to accommodate emotional support animals, but I will kind of, this is my personal opinion. This isn't a legally binding thing. But I would err on the side of being generous just as a sign of being friendly and inclusive to all of your visitors. If somebody has a super well-behaved emotional support animal that's not causing any trouble, I would err on the side of letting them in and not making a big deal out of it. Um, same thing if somebody has brings in somebody brings in a dog and they say it's a service animal, you don't think it is, but it's not causing any trouble and it doesn't look like it's it's not misbehaving or anything. I tend to be more generous on that, but I also work at a place, I, I don't know if I even mentioned this up top, I work at the Morton Arboretum in my day job. So our collection is not priceless artwork, it's trees that are out in nature and it would take a lot for a dog or a misbehaved emotional support animal to hurt them. So that's, that's where my perspective is coming from. If your museum or theater is different, you can have a different perspective on that. Um, but that's where I come down. All of that being said, if a service animal or emotional support animal is misbehaving, if they are barking, if they are growling or threatening at other visitors, if they're pooping on the floor, you can absolutely ask the person to remove the animal. You cannot ask the person to leave, 
because the person is always welcome. But the animal, you can say, you know what? This is just too disruptive to other visitors. They're threatening other visitors. Can you take the dog home and maybe come back with a friend? Or maybe we can arrange just another visit for you that doesn't involve the dog so that you can still have your visit. But um, I don't want you to think that you have to allow everything because that's absolutely not the case. You can you can ban a disruptive animal just like you can ban a disruptive person or ask, ask a disruptive person to leave. Um, so that is the, the quick and dirty on service animals. Again, there is a lot more out there. So if this is something that you are really interested in or your site has a lot of patrons who use service animals, there's a lot more out there you can research. I think that is it for my service animal rant. Thanks, Anna. You know, that's a, there's always a favorite topic. People all have stories related to that. Um, so now let's look a little bit at two disabilities that are very much in, invisible, the cognitive and developmental disabilities. A developmental disability, as you may know, is um, one that is originated at birth or during childhood. So it's something that a person has been, has been with them generally their entire life. Eight million Americans, we now know, have developmental disabilities. So it's not a small number. Um, some examples that you may be familiar with are people on the autis autism spectrum, folks with Down syndrome, for example. On the other hand, a cognitive disability um, is something that is acquired sometime throughout their life or identified sometime throughout their life. So for example, one might be an age-related um, disability where you have loss of memory, Alzheimer's may or may not be diagnosed, um, just general loss of memory, a learning disability such as ADHD, dyslexia, ADD, those kinds of things. Those are all considered disabilities that we want to help people to accommodate um, their visits to our institutions. Um, another one, mental health, depression, anxiety, we're seeing a lot of this happening right now. So again, be aware, be accommodating, be welcoming to people all across the spectrum. Um, another category is brain injury. This is something that is acquired through, maybe through an accident or a stroke or some kind of medical condition. And through many of these, you might notice that people, their relationship with their disability is changing over time. Maybe it's becoming more pronounced and they're trying to figure things out as well as you. So you, it's, it's um, really two people figuring this out, right? That's always the yes, and like, let's figure this out. If you don't necessarily have a program or an idea about what to do specifically for a disability, it's like, let's figure this out. And some of that relates to, um, next slide please, communication. It's all about communication, right? So it's you and the visitor trying to figure things out. So you speak to them directly. Again, a lot of this sounds pretty familiar, right? We talked about this in some of the earlier slides. Don't speak to the companion, speak to the person and also be age appropriate. So notice if you can, um, the age of the person and think, think in your best like teacher brain, right? How, how is the best way to convey information and how is the best way to get the information from the person? Listening, listening very carefully and being very patient. Sometimes if you might not understand, just ask for clarification, you know, try it another way. The same way you do with, um, anyone that you understand in a different language, say for example, a lot of these things are very similar. It's like, come at it from one angle. If that's not working, come at it from another angle. So it's about being patient and trying. And I think that takes us to our last slide. Next slide, tips for welcoming visitors with disabilities. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did also want to make a note, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. We definitely will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of this. So please put them in there. No question is stupid. Everybody is at a different point on their accessibility journey. So some people might need really basic information. Some people may be more advanced, but we're all moving in the same direction, which is the important thing. So please uh, give us your questions. So just to wrap up the formal presentation part of today, the general tips, which you've heard multiple times now, because they apply across the board, don't make assumptions about what somebody's ability is. Always ask if they need help or if you think they might benefit from a service. Accessibility is an extension of good customer service. So any of your frontline staff who are focused on that, this is all incredibly important information for them. 
there's no one size fits all solutions, which is really important to note. We highlighted some tools here, like the assistive listening devices or audio description, um, but every venue is different. Every museum has a weird layout that is unique to that building. Every theater is different. So what works for one space may not work for you. What works for one program in your space may not work for another. So you really have to give some thought to what works for us, what makes the most sense for this specific program. Um, you wanna create, make sure that you create a way for people to request accommodations. Like Susan mentioned in the section on people with hearing related disabilities, you wanna have an email address. And for people, you also wanna have a phone number. Some people are more comfortable communicating over the phone than over written words. So you wanna make sure that's there. And just a note on that too, this should, the most logical place for this to live is on the accessibility page on your website. If you don't have an accessibility page on your website, put maybe do a quick inventory of what you offer, what the common issues that people with disabilities have with your space are, put that all together, put it out there, maybe solicit information from frequent visitors or members um, so that people know what to expect. You don't want people to show up at your venue and be surprised that there is an obstacle they weren't expecting. Um, and that's a great place for your contact info to live. If somebody then contacts you, because of course, if you put that contact info out there, they're going to use it. Um, if somebody reaches out to you and asks for a specific accommodation, say they've requested an ASL interpreter for an upcoming lecture that you're hosting, but you've never done that before, you don't know how, don't say no. Um, if the person answering the phone is not the right person to be uh, making that decision, make sure they know who the access go-to person is within your organization so that they can pass that request along. You always wanna start a conversation, have a constructive discussion with the person who's calling to figure out what they need, what's possible in your space, what you can do. Don't just shut down the conversation and say no. You always wanna open yourself up for discussion because I think a lot of times we just say no as a knee-jerk reaction but a lot more is possible than you may think is possible. So explore it, give it real serious consideration um, when you get those requests that might sound a little out of the blue. Uh, this note here about scheduling. It's important to both have some accommodations that are scheduled in advance so that people can plan in advance and know, oh, there's gonna be an open captioned performance of the Christmas Carol on this date. I will buy tickets for that. I'll make sure I sit in that section. It'll be great. But people can also request accommodations for whatever date they plan to be going. And that's also fine. So it's good to be able to balance both. And a note on that is that the ADA, so this is a legal thing, not a customer service thing. You cannot pass the cost of accommodations onto visitors. Even if somebody called up and said, hey, I'm going to be taking this class at your museum and I I'm deaf and I need an ASL interpreter and you've scheduled that ASL interpreter and they cost money because they're professionals doing a job, um, the museum has to absorb that cost, the additional cost of the interpreter. You cannot pass that along to the person because the ADA is a civil rights law basically saying that we are required to give everybody equal access, which includes communication access. Um, so that is the note on that. And finally, if you want to connect with CCAC, <clears throat> excuse me, we've got some tools here, our website, of course, I know we've mentioned that a few times. We also have our info email if you want to ask a specific question. We have Facebook, we have a not super active Twitter page that we're trying to resurrect a little bit. Um, but yeah, the other big way to connect with CCAC is via our listserv. So you can join that on the website, but there's a lot of communication on there, people reaching out to the local access community in Chicago, trying to figure out um, answers to those access questions that they don't know off the top of their head. So I think that is about it for the formal presentation part of the program and I am actually going to see if I can stop screen sharing without messing up this entire setup. It took us so long to get here. A split view at left speaker at right ASL interpreter. Now we can all just be here together. So let's see. I'm checking now to see what questions have come in. Uh, I saw there was a comment here. 
Vision disabilities can also apply to people who have correct vision, but difficulty with brain processing visual input correctly. Absolutely true. Again, there is a huge range of vision related disabilities. So just because somebody can see something doesn't mean they're able to absorb that information the way that um, you want them to, which again is another reason that you want to have things that are get your information across in multiple formats in multiple ways. Um, don't have it entirely dependent on the written word, because if somebody has trouble reading, that's going to be really uh, challenging for them. I'm seeing a note about, sorry, trying to monitor this in multiple windows. And Susan, feel free to hop in here if you want to help. Well, me. I was going to offer um, the person who put that, I don't want to out you if you don't want to talk on, on camera, but uh, the person who had put that comment in also says they're doing a research program with kids that requires a lot of reading and they are looking for some um, recommendations, someone to help them think out, think about that. And probably somebody in this group would be able to help you improve the experience for those children. So anyone who has any thoughts about expertise in this area, particularly anything that requires a lot of reading. So whether you can see the printed word is one thing, but processing it and taking a lot of information in for people who um, may have ADHD, dyslexia, um, et cetera. Did I summarize that up okay? Yeah, sorry, I'm reading while listening <laughs> simultaneously. Um, I don't and know I, anything I think, off the top of my head, but I think that is a great question for the CCAC listserv because that goes out to over a thousand people. And I feel like somebody there might know somebody. And if you are working with um, schools, Certainly the special ed teachers in that school or if a group is coming to you, that's a great resource. And I think that's to, to kind of put it, not just to put the onus back on the person, but to be thinking like, what works for you? And you know, and can you make that happen? I mean, I'm thinking back to a time I work at the cultural center. And a couple of years ago when we first started thinking about, you know, more actively thinking about um, becoming accessible, being accessible rather, um, someone had called and said that they were deaf and that was the end of the conversation. It was a message that somebody got and passed on to somebody else. So that everybody scrambled. It was the first time we were thinking about doing ASL or, you know, accommodations. Went out, hired a person and we show up and the person was like, I don't know sign language, <laughs> but they didn't give us the information that we needed to make the right thing. So we're like, hold that thought. And so we had like run around and scramble and get like a listening device. So I think going back to the person and asking them not only um, like the same way, like with the service animals, it's like, what, what service do you need or what can, can you help us think this through? I mean, it's not their responsibility, but certainly being a partner in problem solving, I think goes a long way. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, another question that came in on the chat, is it best practice to have both captioning and ASL interpretation? My answer to that is going to be yes, absolutely. If you're serving an audience of any size, you know that today we are offering both CART, open captioning, and ASL interpretation. Um, and similar to what Susan was just saying, if somebody doesn't speak ASL, maybe they are a, a, uh, acquired their deafness later in life and didn't grow up with ASL, maybe CART or um, captioning is a more natural fit for them. I will also say captioning benefits pe more people than just people who are deaf. People for whom maybe English is a second language are gonna benefit from having the written text there. People who might have some sort of processing disorder who have trouble, just like we were talking about people who might have trouble with reading and processing. There are also people who might struggle with listening and processing and for them seeing it written out might be more helpful. Um, so I would say best practice is to have both if you're going to do it. If you're only going to do one, I would probably advise captioning, but this is also kind of a know your audience situation. Um, who, who's your primary audience? Who typically comes? What services do they prefer? Um, and then you can kind of go from there. I know when a lot of theaters are scheduling their accessible performances, they typically are gonna schedule ASL and captioned performances on separate dates because they are kind of separate audiences. Uh, but for something like this, like a, um, a big presentation like this, you'll see, for instance, press conferences. And actually, I know um, Steppenwolf just the other day had the ribbon cutting at their new building because they just built a brand new facility. And they had both CART and ASL because they're, it's a one-time thing that they want to make accessible to as many people as possible. 
Sorry, I'm getting a little frog in my throat. Um, Bill says audio versions of written text are always helpful. Absolutely. Again, have your materials available in multiple formats. So printed, audio, if you can't have audio, maybe if you have somebody, a visitor services staff person who's able to like read something aloud, that's even a decent backup if necessary. Anna, this is Bill. That was in response to the dyslexia and low vision question also is that uh, things audio. I used a lot of audio books in school. It was very helpful. So. Cool, thanks Bill. No, that's super helpful. Um, oh, this is a good one. Um, from Karen says, should access questions go through just one point person or be everybody's responsibility? Susan, do you have an opinion on that one? Yeah, I think it is everyone's responsibility. You know, it's a hard sell for people because, you know, immediately they look at the dollars, right? They're like, I didn't have enough money for, you know, I didn't plan that. And so now I think getting this as part of everyone's consciousness as you mentioned, we've talked a lot about being customer service, thinking about it before you need it, right? Because you really don't want to have to be scrambling for something. It's better to be able to offer the services, put it in your budget, offer it all the time. And if somebody doesn't necessarily need it at that moment, you've already provided it. You have delivered the message that you are welcoming, able, and ready for people to show up. So the next time somebody shows up, you're like, I may not need um, ASL, or I may not be able to use that, but I might see that and say to my friend, you know what, these people are really looking to make it access, make their performance accessible to everyone. So then people feel like they're ready for it. So it's not necessarily putting the onus back on the person who needs the services, but just noticing services are available. That goes a long way. And that's part of the whole staff also um, realizing it's their, it's their business to make that happen, right? So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hard sell in the beginning, but I think we're getting there slowly. And um, I'm hoping that those folks who are here are just starting to be the champions, or maybe you're already great champions at your organizations. So I'll take the counterpoint to that, which is I, not that I disagree that access isn't everybody's job. I, I do think that is true, but having one person delegated to like be the point person that access requests flow through can really be helpful, I think. Because um, a lot of times maybe, not everybody doesn't know who to call if somebody requests an ASL interpreter. Maybe you have one person who's really knowledgeable about all of that stuff and knows how to schedule accessible services and is the, per the one point person that those, quest those tough questions can go to. That can be really helpful, but having that one point person, then you want to make sure that the other staff don't start to feel like, oh, well, that's Anna's job to do accessibility. I don't need to worry about it or learn about it because that's, I think that's the pitfall to that approach is if, if one person has that official title or it's part of their job description, maybe other people aren't as engaged or don't feel like it's as important. Um, so it's everybody's job and it's one person's job. That is not a very clear answer, but um, I, I feel but, like that's the best answer. <laughs> no, I do think you're right. That it's somebody, you need an expert, an expert, you know, I use that in sort of quotes because it's somebody who's going to like pick up the ball and, and keep running with it. But everyone should be not, uh, should be able to like filter questions or filter things to that person, but they should be ready for it at all times. You know, like your frontline staff, security, if you have them, volunteers, et cetera. It's everybody's business to be like, let me let me get let me get the right person for you. Let me help you with that. Not like the default mode of we don't have ASL, you know, because sometimes that's the case. Yeah, I mean, and I again, I will say, not everybody's perfect. I am thinking back to some things that I told visitors early in my career before I knew all of this about accessibility, and I cringe so hard because I was absolutely doing all of the things you're not supposed to do. So we can all grow, we can all learn, we can all be better at, at, job, at our job and be more welcoming for people with disability. Um, I also wanna note Carly from Arts Midwest, the note that she put in the chat here about the Hemingway app. If you are, uh, especially for like programs, it sounds like, or for museum labels, if you wanna make sure that your language is clear and 
understandable. It's a good app to run language through. I think I've read about that before. So that's cool. Thank you, Carly, for putting that resource in the chat. Um, so with that, I think one other question that we got was, what's like a good first step for getting started in accessibility since this is an intro program? I think that's a good one for us to talk through a little bit. Um, Susan, what did DCASE, what was the first thing that you guys started to do? What was your first experience with accessibility? How did you get going? Um, well, I think it was actually um, me wrestling away from the security staff because it used to belong to facilities and securities and they were always the no and people. <laughs> and so when I started hearing about, you know, CCAC and going to some of the programs, me and another person on staff started being like, why are we always saying no to people? You know, so it was basically um, a couple of folks advocating for it. And we um, now it's become part of visitor experience, which is our team. But, um, you know, like you say, starting off with like making some mistakes and kind of going, hmm, that doesn't feel good. You know, I, I wouldn't be, want to be another in this conversation. I, I want to feel more welcomed. But um, I think basically looking around and seeing like, what do you already have? Because I put together shortly after that, like, um, like a spreadsheet. And it was like, which of these things do we offer? And it started, it was very, you know, we have a huge department. And um, we were kind of surprised that we had some things already, you know, so it was kind of looking across the board and saying, you know, a particular person maybe always did their um, programming with large print, you know, you're like, well, how hard is that to do? So we started like taking like a, a survey, if you will, of what you offer, and then kind of look for the low hanging fruit or for the things that are most often um, requested, you know, so I think there is a tool, I, do we have it in our resources still? That was the uh, self-evaluation for organizations. I think that might still be online. If it's not, we can put it online. Yeah, I think that was a really, really great tool. And Christina actually came to our at the Culture Center and walked through with us, and you know, had good things to say, and then also gave us some really um, some great tips. You know, because we have an old building that you can't necessarily change, and we had some stairs that we were putting like chairs under, and people could like, you know, get hit in the noggin. So we were like, stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, I think that tool that Susan's referring to is part of the ADA 25 for 25 project, which, oh my goodness, it was almost almost 10 years ago now, I feel. Um, but that was, or five years ago, I don't know. Time is a flat circle. Um, on the 25th anniversary of the ADA, the city of Chicago wanted to really celebrate accessibility. And so they did this big project where they brought together 25 different cultural institutions to try to make, who are gonna commit themselves to being more accessible. And as part of that, some CCAC members, including our founder, Christina Gunther, came up with this huge long checklist for institutions to go through and do a self-evaluation for how accessible their sites are, which is definitely a good place to start. I would definitely recommend that. Um, and, and one of the things that Susan touched on, I think is also worth mentioning, which is your frontline staff, your box office staff, your visitor services staff, the people who are on the, on the ground working with your visitors and your patrons every single day, if you go to them at a staff meeting and ask them, hey, what are the most common issues that you see people having with our space? What are the most commonly requested items that you have to say no to? What, what do you think would be a good way for us to get started? I bet you they're gonna have a ton of ideas because they're the ones who have to tell people no and have those uncomfortable conversations. So my experience has been that those, those staff members really have a good um, have their finger on the pulse of, of what visitors need. So I would start there as well. I think the evaluation is good. I think asking your frontline staff, you can't go wrong to get their, get their feedback. Um, oh, thank you, Claire, for dropping the self-evaluation tool in, or the link to it in the chat. I thought it was still online. <laughs> So I think we're winding down now. I think we're going to end up ending a little bit early today since uh, you don't seem like a very chatty bunch. There aren't too many questions coming out. But the one question I kind of wanted to end on, discussion question that Susan can speak to, if anybody else has opinions, feel free to uh, drop them in the chat. But what do you think is the most rewarding part of the accessibility work that you have done? 
what's made it all worth it. I know it's not always easy. You're asking the group in general, yeah? I'm asking the group in general, but I'm putting you on the spot because you're the other speaker today. Oh, okay. No, I'm totally, I'm totally ready for this one. And Bill, you better sit, you better back me up on this. Um, <laughs> we um, had a nice relationship with Bill when he was with the Blind Service Association. And um, I had an experience that I didn't find very satisfying with a someone doing an audio description um, at an art institution talking about what people couldn't see, right? And so I thought that didn't make a lot of sense to me. So with Bill's help, we started looking at our building and doing a tour that spoke to all the senses. So it wasn't like, sorry, you can't see this. That's really cool. Let me tell you about it. You know, it was more like walking through the building, hearing things. We were able to touch things. We were able to participate um, with Goat Island and wear some of the costumes and do a whole sound piece. So, um, you know, finding a good partner who will help you think through those things and kind of, you know, you don't have to be perfect before you do it. You just have to get started with doing it and go to it with, you know, clean heart. What do you say, Bill? I will back you up 100%. Those were great. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. It's when you get to do programs like that, when you get to bring groups in and do, um, like actually work with people. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun to be in a meeting and talk about all the logistics for an adult changing table, but it's way more fun to bring a, a group of people to, um, we, have, we have tactile lion whiskers now, and I've got to share that with quite a few groups of people who are blind and low vision, and I love it. I love it so much. It's so much fun, so. And um, that once you start doing that, like we had, found this piece that had fallen off the ceiling in Preston Bradley Hall and they had to create a mold for this plaster piece. And so the idea was everyone can touch this. Well, everyone can touch this. So it's not only people who are using that as a substitute for not seeing it, but like everybody wants to touch this thing. And so now that uh, we're renovating our building, um, the Grand Army of the Republic Dome, um, I've become kind of the the keeper of all things that are tactile. So I'm like hanging out there all the time going, well, that looks like something fun to touch. And so the guys who work are giving me little pieces that fall off the, <laughs> the ceiling that we can still touch. And so I'm now working on creating a space, a touch gallery for everyone, right? So it's not just people who are doing this instead of seeing, it's like, this is another sense that we're all, we're all able to use. So yeah. um, stay tuned for when that comes out. I'm pretty excited about it. That's awesome. This is the first I'm hearing of that. So that's super exciting. Um, and that actually, like for my response to what I, what I think has made it the most rewarding is kind of what Karen alluded to in the chat. I think making your programs, making your space more accessible, you may not realize that your programs aren't the best that they can be until you start doing some of these things and then realize, oh my gosh, this is actually really augmenting the experience for everybody. So it really just does make your programs better. It makes it it's especially if you're in education, it makes it easier for different types of learners. It makes it a more dynamic experience if things are more accessible. Plus, more families can visit with all of their family members and people don't feel excluded or left at home. So I think that overarching uh, sentiment of it just generally making programs better is worth noting. So with that, I think we're actually gonna wrap up a little bit early today. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And also thank you to my behind the scenes team. Um, thank you, Karen, for helping us work out our captioning issues uh, today. Um, again, if you wanna support CCAC's work, making theaters and museums more accessible, you can make a donation on our website, chicagoculturalaccess.com. Also, again, I want to plug next week's program, which is that panel discussion between um, some CCAC moderators and then four individuals who, like I said, are going to bring very different diverse perspectives on disability to have a conversation with us. Um, so if you haven't registered for that, you can also do that on our website. Highly recommend. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Fade to Black, white text on Black background. Access 101, an introduction to disability and accessibility. Presented by Chicago Cultural Accessibility Consortium. For workshop resources and more information, visit chicagoculturalaccess.org.
Presenting speakers, Anna Kosner, Director of Retail and Events at Morton Arboretum. Susan Friel, Education and Engagement Visitor Experience at Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Workshop Accessibility, Caption Solutions, Real-Time Captioning. Bronwyn Schlafer and Danielle Helgeson, ASL Interpreters. Video Editing, Captioning and Audio Description by BridgetMelton.com.